let me introduce uh, Om first. Uh, so he's the CEO of uh, Musashi AI. It's an Israeli-Japanese partnership and uh, the world's first employment agency for industrial robots, which I think uh, is something that sounds really cool. And I had a chat with him earlier about that and uh, I'm sure he has uh, a lot of interesting insights. So the company develops robotic quality control inspectors for manufacturing clients, uh, as well as the central brain for navigation and control for autonomous mobile robots. Uh, Al himself has uh, over 15 years uh, of experience in uh, senior management and entrepreneurship. Prior to Musashi, he was uh, the CEO of um, Rioglass Solar Systems, where he led it from inception to becoming the world's largest developer and supplier of receivers used in solar thermal power plants. And prior to Rioglass, um, he held uh, various finance management roles uh, between tech companies such as Siemens and Cisco. Before that, uh, he was at uh, Amdocs as a delivery manager, um, and um, he was also delivering OSS services at uh, British Telecom. Um, on on entrepreneurial experience also includes um, co-founding uh, Duty Freebie, a uh, price comparison platform for duty free goods, and uh, NIAI, a medical devices company fighting uh, transmission of infectious diseases in hospitals. Um, he began his career as a cybersecurity analyst for the Israeli government um, after his military service there in the IDF forces. He um, graduated from Boot um, No. 8 uh, in the executive program, he has uh, extensive international experience uh, and um, obviously an MBA from Boot. Uh, so we're very happy to have him uh, here with us today. Ben uh, Ziumek is uh, part of the full-time uh, 2019 program. Uh, so just last year, he's the CTO of Actuate. Um, it's a New York-based uh, AI security startup that builds computer vision software to turn any camera into a smart camera. He started his career at Microsoft, where he led teams uh, of engineers and data scientists leveraging AI to identify high potential startups globally driving nine figures of cloud revenue. Ben also has experience working as an AI consultant in Chicago, San Fran, Tel Aviv, uh, and as a VC investing uh, in AI and gaming startups. Uh, also quite an uh, interesting AI background, and um, he'll talk a little bit about his company as well and what they do, um, but it obviously has uh, a lot, both of their companies have a lot of uh, ethical issues that they're um, dealing with, and that would be quite interesting. So. Ben has also recently been recognized on the 2020 Forbes 30 under 30 list um, uh, for his work at Actuate, and um, I'm very happy to have him here as well. And to both of them, uh, I'm hoping for a very fruitful discussion, which I hope you guys can help us by asking questions in the Q&A. So thank you both for joining. Um, and um, on, if you don't mind, if you can uh, share a little bit about your company, your experience, and just um, start get us going. Thanks so much, Gorgi, for the uh, introduction. And I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to thank you, Heather, Jenny, and everyone else at Booth for organizing this event and uh, obviously for inviting me. So uh, really humbled by the uh, opportunity and uh, grateful for the invitation. Musashi AI uh, is basically the world's first employment agency for industrial robots. We are a partnership, uh, an Israeli-Japanese partnership, that undertook quite an ambitious mission to unlock the workforce transformation of this new era of uh, uh, hyperconnectivity and AI, which we are actually entering. Um, we fuse innovative Israeli technology with Japanese industrial exp uh, expertise, and we develop, uh, train, and deploy an AI-based robotic workforce. Um, our partner is a Japanese corporation called Musashi Seimitsu. It's a Honda Motor subsidiary, uh, a global tier one auto parts manufacturer. So uh, actually the collaboration we have with them allows us not only to immediately access, uh, immediate access to pilot or robotic workforce in real manufacturing floors, but also to have a direct access to, to the market, starting with their 33 uh, factories worldwide. Now, to give you a little bit of a background, where we come from, 
um, I'll share with you some, some interesting facts um, that actually uh, I was familiar with when I was in my previous uh, role as a CEO of Freeoblast, but not uh, to, the, um, to the magnitude that uh, things really are. So here's the thing. About 40% of the global manufacturing workforce is not engaged in, produ in producing or material, sorry, in production or in material processing. So 20% roughly performs visual quality control inspection of components, which is mostly common in the automotive, airspace, and uh, some other industries. And another 20% is engaged in material handling, either driving forklifts or pushing carts. Now this is pretty incredible, right? When you think about it, roughly 40% of the manufacturing labor force in the average manufacturing company is not really engaged in producing goods. Now, the flip side is that 40% is engaged in super tedious, monotonic, rigorous job with absolutely no satisfaction or sense of self-fulfillment. And the productivity and cost effectiveness of those employees doing these jobs is questionable. So uh, we basically decided to concentrate on this long tail of underutilized workforce. Um, and develop two products. The first is an AI-based visual quality control inspector, as you mentioned. Uh, we are expecting surface defects in gears, bearings, and other manufactured parts, which require 100% quality inspection as a result of super high cost of nonconformity. The second is an ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, uh, and Central Navigation and Control System for Autonomous Mobile Robots. This, uh, these are used uh, mostly in logistics, in material handling, um, cleaning, security, and many other applications. One of the uh, booming industries in the last couple of years. Our business model is OPEX-based as opposed to CAPEX-based. So we're not uh, selling capital equipment. We're making our robots available on a per-per-use model, robots as a service. And in terms of technology, I can say that we are um, using edge computing deep learning and advanced image and video processing to build and train robots that perform tasks faster and more effective than um, existing solutions. Um, just uh, maybe to say something about our customers, our customers are naturally automotive companies, logistics companies, and other manufacturing companies. So this in a nutshell, who we are. Thanks, so, um, Ben, if you uh, don't mind also uh, sharing with us kind of uh, a little bit about your work with Actuate and uh, uh, what uh, kind of uh, issues and, uh, and items you have been dealing with in the last couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Georgie. And also thank you so much to everybody who's uh, here for the presentation. This is a really fantastic showing. I don't think I've seen this high conversion rate from uh, people who signed up to attendees in any of the other webinars I've done. So Booth is absolutely a great community. In a nutshell, at Actuate, we're a computer vision startup that turns any camera into a smart camera for security, building management, and defense applications. So that's gotten a little bit broad recently. And the reason for that is that we, Sunny Tai, who was a classmate of Georgie's in, in 15, <clears throat> started the company originally because his family grew up, he grew up in South Africa where his family was impacted by gun violence and always wanted to do something to make it easier for organizations to protect themselves against gun violence. In this case, by using AI to automatically detect weapons in security camera feeds. And so the reason I'm here instead of Sunny is because I got involved in 2018 uh, because while working as a VC, I thought that maybe I wanted to jump back to the startup space. And I'd spent a lot of time previously in my career thinking about the privacy aspects of AI. And so when I heard the idea that's now become Actuate, which is using video surveillance and AI analytics, which are very scary, very kind of dystopian concepts, but applying them in a way where you can respect privacy and you can eliminate bias and you can be about as compliant as any security camera system can possibly be, got me really, really excited. So I was thrilled to be invited to this talk because uh, privacy and bias around AI is really what I've made the focus of my career over the past few years and is something I'm extremely passionate about. So diving into that a little bit, what exactly we do is that we connect to existing security camera systems and we monitor them for threats or patterns of behavior that could be interpreted as problems for building managers. Critically, 
we're not looking at any individuals. We don't do facial recognition and we don't synchronize our database with any type of external personally identifiable information. Functionally, we're looking for a weapon as an object or a person as an object. And then we analyze different patterns of behavior of people or groups of people, such as social distancing issues, crowds, or just general people counting and people flow to help business managers and security teams understand how people are using their space and keep their organizations safe, especially in this uh, new normal that we find ourselves in with coronavirus. Um, I think the, the critical thing on top of this is that we are not really providing brand new capabilities to the market. There have been solutions that you've been able to buy for 10 plus years where you install specific hardware to detect gunshots, you install specific sensors to detect, um, to count people, count density. Our real nuance is that we've come in and said that you've already invested in security camera systems and by using deep learning and computer vision and because we're the best in the world at, at identifying specific classes of objects in the highly complex scenes that you get in security camera footage, we can give you comparable or better accuracy to hardware-based solutions without having to install anything else on site. So we're actually one of the only companies in the broader security and defense space that is 100% a software solution because everybody else wants to come and screw some new sensor to the ceiling. And we find that those are the key differentiators that we have is that we're super accurate because we're the best at what we do. We're software only, so we're easy to install. And critically, we're really focused on privacy, bias, and compliance. Uh, I think we're one of the only AI companies where you can go on our website and the first link at the top is actually our policy around bias and privacy. And that's something we're really proud of at Actuate. Thanks, Ben. And that actually um, is very interesting because you're talking about uh, the importance of, um, of the privacy issues that you face. and. Uh, that it, it's a prominent display on your website. But can you, uh, both of you, maybe start with Ben, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the time you spent thinking about the potential ethical problems of uh, your AI technology. Um, again, Ben, you mentioned it's software only. Um, so in that context, uh, you started talking a little bit about it. But um, yeah, if you can talk a little bit about uh, the time you spent thinking about the potential ethical problems, that'd be lovely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Georgie. So Ann and I had a chance to sync uh, last week. And I think the structure that I presented uh, of how we think about ethical problems is that there's really three buckets when you come to AI of thinking about ethical, privacy, whatever issues. The first one is really about job displacement. So if you're going to be automating somebody's task, what does that mean for their employment? And I know Ann's company has done some really great and powerful thinking about this. On our end, while we do think about how we can lower the workload of security staff, it tends to be much more of a cloud computing scenario while Theoretically, we're getting rid of low-level tasks. In reality, security budgets don't, don't shrink. Those people go back to doing what they were hired to do, which is keeping buildings secure, versus going through video footage, which is a super low-value activity. So luckily, after a lot of conversations, that's not something that we feel is a really strong ethical problem in our business. But that leads the second two which is privacy, because if you're doing facial recognition, if you're identifying individuals in any way, even if you keep that data secure, you're still open to subpoenas, you're still open to government requests, you're still open to lawsuits. And so we've constructed our system from the ground up in a specific way that doesn't have any private information in the system whatsoever. The one possible exception to this, of course, is images of people. Because if we detect a weapon, then we're gonna have to show that image to our customer and we're gonna have to store that image because otherwise the system doesn't work very well. But even in this area, what we've found and what our policy is, is that unless it's a life safety risk where you really do need that, a backup of that video footage, we've actually moved in a direction where we don't even show privacy uh, images or images of individuals at all in our UI. We're just showing you high level information. We're showing you flows, we're showing you alerts, we're showing you heat maps and trend lines. And then if you really wanna go see that video, you can go, we can give you the timestamps and you can go back in your own system. But that's not something that we are doing. And similarly, on the bias side, I'm sure that most people here have heard about issues that systems like Amazon recognition have had on doing facial recognition on people from different ethnic backgrounds. And our approach there was also to focus on building a solution that just looks as, at people as people. We're not actually analyzing what somebody looks like. We're not analyzing what their background is. And so that's allowed us to really sidestep a lot of the bias issues and make sure that we're doing something that is very robust from day one. 
But even here, I mean, you have to be very focused on nuance. My company had a big internal debate over the last few weeks uh, with a lot of the protests that we've seen nationally, where we actually came to the conclusion that we need to accelerate the process of not showing specific images. Because even if our system is unbiased and we show an image of somebody that was detected doing something, uh, the user's reaction to that could result in bias, even if the system itself is not biased. And then secondly, even though we're not analyzing individuals, uh, it turns out when you're doing things like mass compliance detection, which we're hoping to do with uh, the city of Chicago soon, white people wearing white masks and black people wearing black masks are pretty difficult. And so it's even those edge cases, which are seemingly really minor, that we have to make sure we do really rigorous testing on to ensure that our system is unbiased and completely compliant through and through. So that was kind of a long answer, but I, I'm thrilled to hear what On has to say on the topic. Okay, so Gorgi, you basically asked about the, uh, you know, whether or not we thought about the ethical problems. So <laughs> I think we, uh, we absolutely recognize the potential ethical problems um, of our business. After all, we are an employment agency for robots. And I think uh, when you declare you're an employment agency for robots, you can't avoid the criticism or at least the questions, right? Um, I think, um, you know, reflecting back, it probably all started more than a year ago when uh, I met here in Israel with the second largest uh, placement agency in Japan. They actually sent a delegation, quite a big one, uh, to Israel to scout for AI technologies. Um, you know, when you think about it, what's, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a recruitment agency, what the hell, uh, why the hell are they interested in AI? So when I met them, they told me something which was quite incredible. Um, which actually probably only Japanese can think of, that they acknowledge the fact that if they do not do something about their business model, then within 10 years from now, they'd become obsolete. So, um, you know, this was like a, a eureka moment for us and how we started developing this idea and this concept of an employment agency for robots. And um, I really think that the introduction of smart robotics can and will at the end of the day optimize the utilization of human labor and uh, increase employee self-fulfillment. It's clear that robots can undertake the repetitive, rigorous, uh, but essential tasks and freeing uh, us human employees uh, to do more complex and engaging work where we have a distinct advantage over a machine. Um, all this has a clear benefit of increased productivity um, at a lower operating cost. But um, then the unavoidable question is, what, what about the people, right? Um, so I think that if you're working like a robot, you will most probably be replaced by one eventually. And it's not the employee's fault. I mean, throughout history, we humans um, have built artificial corporate structures that have forced us to be something that we're not and do things we're not passionate about and not supposed to do. And uh, I think that with the advancements of technology, however, this can now change. Um, I think employees can now be engaged in more uh, self-fulfilling and rewarding activities where they can put into practice their distinct extraordinary human capacities. By the way, we all have uh, extraordinary human capacities. That's why we're human. We just need to treat people as what they are, uh, or what they ought to be and not what they are. Um, this is actually Geta, I didn't invent it. And um, so in order to put things into perspective, uh, we are in connection with the recruitment agencies and placement agencies, um, mainly in Japan, but we're gonna take it worldwide, um, who find our business model very exciting. Um, and uh, the plan is to reassign or to build reassignment programs for employees and shifting them from the monotonous jobs that they have no added value in doing to jobs they can really make a difference and leave their mark on. So we actually don't see ourselves as part of the problem, but part of the solution. Um, at the end of the day, I think that AI could be a great catalyst for a new world of opportunities for mankind for, uh, you know, to find meaning and to explore our unique human capacities. So um, that's, that's how we, uh, you know, we treat the, um, the ethics issue. And, um, thanks for that. I truly appreciate it. Um, it's personally 10 years ago, I was doing some paper binders and whenever uh, we automated that was one of the best uh, 
uses of my time in my first company um, out of uh, university some 10, 15 years ago. So I fully understand what you're trying, what you're describing here. Um, in, in line of that, so you set some of the programs to relocate people um, in Japan right now uh, and soon worldwide. So kind of, um, do you have any uh, examples in terms of uh, the relocation or of these people or um, do you have any kind of uh, stories about it? But one, I think one of the, one of the issues that people are facing uh, is that when they get displaced by automation, they usually get trained in jobs that are far more likely to be automated soon. And it's just a process of stress and moving on from one job to another, which is in danger of, uh, kind of disappearing. <laughs> So I think, um, you know, the, maybe the underlying question here is, will robots actually replace us at the end of the day? Because that's, that's what people are afraid of. Um, and you asked about uh, what kind of jobs these, uh, um, you know, what kind of new jobs these employees can do. Um, and this is a very, very interesting question, actually. Um, and I want to give you maybe a little bit of a, of a background or, or some, some new angle to, to, to look at things, if I may. So we're all familiar with the, uh, with the Stanford Binet IQ test, right? Um, this invention that has served for years as the standard process uh, to measure intelligence is, um, in my mind at least, responsible for one of the most unfortunate and biased concepts in modern education. Um, and I say that because the IQ test assumes not only that intelligence is constant, something you're born with and cannot develop over time, but also that it can be measured with a single test. Now, studies made over the years have shown, however, that under certain circumstances, people can actually improve their IQ score. And I think this raises some disturbing questions about whether or not intelligence can be quantified to begin with and uh, about the way we address intelligence altogether. Now, the standardized testing, such as SAT and GMAT, are still widely used, as you know, by the global education system, including by this prestigious academic institution. Uh, each of us has to take the GMAT, unfortunately. That was a nightmare, I have to say, at least from my personal perspective. So this test is presume, you know, presumably determining, pe determining people's professional career and sometimes their, their entire future. But these tests measure only a very narrow aspect of our intelligence, the one that is related only to the ability to exercise certain quantitative and verbal thinking, which indeed measures certain aspects of intelligence, but certainly not all of it. And I think that even psychologists today acknowledge that intelligence cannot be measured by a single test. Um, and it can actually come in various shapes and forms. And the traditional definition of intellect is limited to a very narrow aspect of the overall human capacity. And so now, why do I tell you all this? Because I believe that understanding that intelligence is not limited to only quantitative and verbal capabilities is important in order to begin understanding how AI could impact our lives. Because with the help of AI, I think that humans uh, will be able to pursue their natural talents without prejudice and make a living out of it. You know, there's a saying uh, that every Jewish mom would like her son or daughter to be either a doctor or a lawyer. I guarantee you that there's no a single Jewish mom uh, who would uh, wish for her son or daughter to be an artist or a musician. Um, and I ask why not, you know? Um, and if you put it in the context of AI, I think that AI uh, can optimize the utilization of uh, human labor by introducing intelligent machines that will replace humans in performing all those rigorous and repetitive jobs that we spoke about. But it will also uh, free people to focus on what they do best, which is engaged in problem solving and solving complex problems that require the human X factor, as I call it, the intuition, the compassion, the creativity to engage in art and in communication and uh, in taking care of each other, educating uh, the young and taking care of the elders. So I think we will need more, you asked about the jobs. I think that uh, all, all in all, we will need uh, more jobs of love and compassion, more jobs of education, which is where AI can't help. And we will need more social workers and caregivers and elderly companions. And we will need more teachers in our education system who can teach wisdom as opposed to knowledge, because at the end of the day, no one can compete with Google in teaching knowledge. 
Um, actually, when you think about the last 100 years, so 100 years ago, 95 of the world's working population was engaged in agriculture. And today, just 100 years later, less than 10% of the world's uh, working population is engaged in agriculture. And you ask yourself, where did the other 80% go? Have they become unemployed? Clearly the answer is no. And the fact is that every technological revolution bettered our lives in terms of health, standard, standard of living, and even the job design. You know, the job, job has dramatically changed over the years. So I really think that artificial intelligence will eventually redu can reduce the cost of living. Um, it will serve as a tool for creativity, meaning it will enable artists as well as scientists and musicians and writers and CEOs and M&A experts to be even more creative and more effective. Um, in our case, on the manufacturing floors, AI will not replace humans altogether. There's no way um, AI or robots will replace humans. Um, but they will actually work side by side with humans as assistive analytical tools, as performance enhancers, uh, cost reducers, and leaving the more humane jobs for humans, uh, which are jobs of planning and designing, which require creativity and innovation, um, jobs of monitoring and coordination of complex problem solving, which require intuition, require judgment, uh, deduction, which is what we humans are best at at the end of the day. So, you know, you ask what new skill set we need to teach those uh, employees who will be replaced by robots. Um, so they're not left behind. And uh, I say we don't need to teach them anything new. They already know what they are best at. After all, each of us has extraordinary human capacities. And we just need to, to uh, bring people back to their natural human inherent qualities that distinct us from machines. And, uh, and for everything else, there's AI. So that's, that's my perspective on the new uh, or the future to be uh, jobs. Thanks, Om. I um, actually, yeah, I agree with uh, the need for jobs that require empathy. I don't think we'll be ever uh, replaced by machines. Um, okay, so I know um, my co-organizer here, uh, Heather Waite, uh, she has been keeping an eye on the question coming in. And... Um, She's the president of the Alumni Club in London. So Heather, um, are there any questions um, that uh, caught your eye and uh, we can ask our participants? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so a couple of things. One is please do continue to submit questions. There's a way to do that online. So please feel free to do that. And I will keep an eye on those and, and pick up on those. Um, I'm going to pick up on one that was submitted in advance. So thank you very much for the people that did that. Uh, follows on quite nicely from what you were just talking about on. And I'll get both of your views on this, please. So if you thinking about this, um, Thinking a bit more around the sort of mass application of, of AI in daily life, when do you foresee that that will happen? Or do you think that this is already there? We just don't recognize it as AI. Um, and then the sort of second part of that is, do you believe that AI, um, I love this part, can be programmed to be fully under control? Um, and then possibly as a final part of that, do you think there are any risks of increasing AI capabilities? I know that's a multi-part question and uh, maybe if I can start, I'm gonna start with Ben this time. Yeah, that's a big question. So thank you to whoever submitted it. Um, can you remind me of the first piece of it just so I can hit them all? Yeah, sure. So the first bit is around when do you really see this, this mass application of AI yeah. or do you think we are actually already there? So I think my favorite joke about AI is that it's not really AI if you can build it because the type of capabilities that we take for granted today around things like translation or even something as basic as this background that I have that makes me look like I'm at Booth would have been considered like phenomenal, truly artificial intelligent applications in the 90s. And yet today it's considered completely trivial. And I think this is connected to other concepts such as ambient computing that people think, oh, someday everything will be smart and it'll be an internet of everything. But again, from the perspective of 20 years ago, we're basically already there. And so I think the question really connects back to On's previous answer, which is AI is only going to feel like it's truly alive, arrived once it really impacts the way that we work on a day-to-day -day basis. 
like pretty much all of our leisure time to some extent is already being impacted by intelligent algorithms from stupid phone games to how you go to the cinema. And it's going to be once we are displaced or once there's some sort of challenge in the work environment that people really feel like the age of AI is upon us. And I think the question of risks also connects very well with Ann's previous answer, because I think on one side, this idea of like post scarcity society, uh, this being the next great wave of automation, like the first and second industrial revolutions and the green revolution that will take humans away from the mundane tasks, maybe white collar tasks that we do now, but mundane tasks all the same and put us in a situation where people can truly be self-actualized and do what they want with their time. And I think this is clearly the dream. I mean, what's the point of post-industrial society if that's not what we're pursuing? I think the real risk is frankly a political one, which is how do we manage this? Like this is where things are going. I do have my own doubts if we really have a strong enough view into the future of technology to say that this is inevitable at this point, but we're definitely a lot closer to a post-scarcity world than we ever were. And yet our politics, especially here in the US, are very much rooted in the concept of scarcity. And you often hear people saying they don't even know what they would do if they didn't have to work for a living. And I think this is a massive uh, cultural and societal shift that is going to start, and it is actually already impacting the way politics works globally. And I actually think, I say political because we're already starting to see problems with how uh, political systems work given people's fears for the future, even when AI has not truly impacted work environments yet. And so that I see is the number one risk uh, going forward, even before we truly have the technology to start to move people away from mundane productive tasks. What are your thoughts on? I definitely agree. Uh, you know, I think this train has uh, long left the the platform. Um, so AI is, is pretty much everywhere. <clears throat> the, uh, you know, we can talk maybe hours about the reason why it's not prolifer proliferating uh, uh, more um, um, heavily because the technology is already, is obviously out there and the need is obviously out there. Um, <clears throat> and there are many companies who are trying to uh, um, implement AI technologies and develop uh, new AI technologies. I think that the, uh, so AI as a key force, a key driving force of our lives is, uh, is inevitable. I think we need to get used to the fact that uh, more and more um, activities, not only jobs, but you know, leisure activities you mentioned is gonna be uh, predominantly uh, controlled by AI. And I think it's our, our responsibility to treat it or develop it responsibly and uh, smartly um, to avoid uh, or to minimize because we won't be able to avoid but to minimize the ethical questions uh, or the challenges i think that you know um, uh, no one is planning uh, to uh, deploy a terminator uh, uh, produced by cyberdyne or skynet for those who uh, were already around when this movie came out um, so that, you know, th those uh, ethical questions were already um, there um, many years ago. I think that uh, at the end of the day, um, um, AI will enable us to build a better world for ourselves because <clears throat> the technologies, I mean, AI will be, uh, will make uh, uh, more cheaper and more accessible food that will be uh, uh, grown by AI. It will enable cheaper housing. It will enable uh, cheaper energy and more accessible energy resources. And there, as a result, the workplace will change. It will be the, the standard of living will increase, but the cost of living will decrease. And obviously the workplace uh, will change. It will be modernized and humanized by the development of AI technologies, which will ultimately liberate us to practice more humane jobs, as I said before. Um, you know, famous uh, futurists uh, say that one of the goals or primary activities of humanity in the 21st century is to fight death and create human enhancement technologies which would alter the human body in order to enhance physical or mental capabilities. So we could potentially be stronger, we could jump uh, higher, we could think faster, and God knows what else. Uh, I'm, not, I'm personally not that excited, to be honest 
I think we don't, we don't need to keep chasing the technology train uh, in driving, that is driving full steam ahead and try to make humans think and act like machines. Uh, we were born uh, humans, thank God, and I think that we should be thankful for that and embrace it. Um, so I think it all boils down to, uh, uh, you know, where um, we will take AI. And I think, as you said, as you rightfully said, uh, Ben, if you can build it, then probably it's not uh, AI completely. Um, I think, you know, the, the most uh, complex uh, engine on this planet is the human brain. And so far, and I, I presume that no one will ever be able to completely mimic this, uh, um, you know, amazing uh, creation. Um, so personally, I'm, I'm not so scared about the implications of AI, as long as we treat it smartly. Um, but I think we need to go back to basics. We need to keep remembering uh, that uh, technology at the end of the day is just uh, an assistive tool for us to live uh, a better life, uh, much more uh, calm and easy and uh, self-fulfilling and, um, you know, and, and leave all the tedious and uh, mundane uh, tasks for machines. Thanks, Bolt. Um, I'm going to bring it back to something Ben started talking about, which is the politics of things. But before I do, I just want to thank Home for mentioning the Terminator, because one of my personal goals for this chat was uh, about three days ago was to mention the Terminator uh, randomly. So you solved that for me. Um, but uh, so, Ben, um, I know we, we had a chat um, last week uh, that um, we discussed this, but it's, it's about the role, the role of the governments in all this. So how do you plan to interact with governments whose human rights record is not up to snuff? Um, so I know one of the um, audience members has asked, um, do you believe that global politicians will sustain the same caution as the US in relation to AI? Uh, personally, I'm even skeptical about uh, the US government, which is uh, generally a very good track record, uh, you know, here and there. Uh, but um, yeah, so what are your thoughts on the kind of the role of the government in all this? I think there's two primary pieces when we talk about the role of government in these new technologies. One is regulation and the other is government access. And this has become very contentious in the United States recently with things like uh, Project Maven from Google automatically analyzing drone footage. And so I think these have to be treated somewhat separately. And so to start on the regulation side, I think that generally governments don't know what they don't know right now. Um, the European Commission does like to overstep in terms of uh, like, I. IT and tech regulation in general. But I, I think the concern is that people start to think about AI as a monolithic block rather than subcomponents. So I've done some writing on the whole issues around facial recognition. And while of course we've made the conscious decision not to offer facial recognition for ethical issues, and so we may be biased, our view is that there's actually a very strong um, legal argument especially within the context of things like GDPR, to dramatically limit organizations' abilities to deploy or at least store facial recognition data. And I think that's something that is reasonable and that some governments, we've already seen it start with local governments, but some national governments will start to adopt over the next few years, and that's fine. The risk is that a lot of new technologies will get looped into the same regulation fervor. So if you're trying to regulate computer vision, versus facial recognition, you're going to have a lot of problems because nobody knows exactly what computer vision can do right now. It's an open book. It's not something that we can objectively define well enough to regulate it. One really great example here is the rise of technology like deep fakes, which are AI generated algorithms that you can, that can make it seem like a person is saying something that they never said. And we've seen these with Obama, we've seen these with Trump, and there have been calls to regulate that type of technology. And I think that's really scary because right now, while the technology may be limited to making silly memes or maybe politically questionable videos, like this same technology has the potential to be a wellspring of innovation around real-time entertainment. Like imagine school children being able to create their own feature film with the help of AI. Like this stuff is actually pretty close to being real. 
And if you regulate that type of technology, you could cut off this massive creative and innovative wellspring of opportunity uh, without really solving the core problem of bad actors getting access to technology in the first place. And so that's why, in a nutshell, I strongly believe that government regulation of AI is going to happen and it's not going to be a bad thing so long as they regulate the application and not the technology. And secondly, uh, just to be brief on selling to governments, I think there's a big debate about this broadly in the technology sector. And I started my career at Microsoft and I think I tend to align pretty well with their ethical view on this, which is if a technology is being used by a democratic government in alignment with its laws that have been agreed upon by the citizens, I really don't know if it's the place of a private company to say that we shouldn't be selling that sort of technology in that place. Obviously, I do think companies have an ethical burden to say that if that government stops using it in a way that is legal, or if they start using it in a way that is no longer democratically sanctioned, then you should reevaluate that. But I think crossing out the sales of AI to Western governments is just a really bad idea because China is not going to stop. And the, all of the governments across the EU, Israel, and the United States do need access of this te to this technology in the 21st century. Otherwise, they're going to fall deeply behind countries without these sort of ethical qualms. Thank you. Appreciate that answer. Um, so, um, Heather, can you um, yes. chime in with uh, any questions you might have seen? Yes, we have a question that's come in as, um, as we've been chatting, which is great. So let me pick up on this one. So I'd love to get your thoughts on how do you fight against, um, against some of the biases that we, that we have heard about in AI, particularly when you're actually sort of coding the algorithms? How do you actually do it at that level? What should people be looking for and, and, and sort of doing to fight against that? And maybe if I can start, I'll start with Om this time. So the question is about the, um, just to make sure I understand, the ethical problems of the algorithm? Yeah, the biases, potential, the potential for bias within AI coming from actually the algorithms that are, that are being coded and how can you actually do things when you're coding that make sure that these are not coming through in the uh, overall AI, for example. Okay. Um, you know, at the end of the day, when we, when we designed our products initially, um, we designed it, designed it in a way that it should uh, replace a human employee because the, the goal was initially to uh, take off, uh, you know, employees from those two uh, um, really, um, you know, tedious and, and monotonous tasks. Um, with regards to the, uh, our quality control inspect inspector, so we basically uh, decided to uh, try to build a system that would mimic 100% uh, the way an employee uh, does a, a human inspection. Obviously, that's that's a super challenging task. And the reason why AI um, comes into play here is because the traditional algorithms, the rule-based algorithms, can work um, when you don't have a, um, a very defined criteria for a defect. So when you have a, a closed set of defects that you're looking for, um, most of the times you will be able to uh, detect them with uh, rule-based algorithms, traditional algorithms. Now, when you have a, you know, one uh, human inspector that is looking at a defect in the morning and, and uh, determining that a certain defect is indeed a defect and in the evening, the same uh, kind of defect looks okay, then you have a problem because the criteria is not very clear. So when we um, started designing our algorithms, we tried uh, to mimic the neural networks that we use in our brain um, in order to generate uh, an automatic or autonomous uh, solution. Um, so obviously we, we focus only on the, on the criteria to uh, distinguish between a defect and a non-defect. So um, we didn't uh, encounter any, uh, I would say, uh, ethical issues with that. Of course, we encountered ethical issues with the overall idea of of uh, displacing employees. Uh, same, by the way, with the, um, um, our central system for navigation, which is meant to replace uh, a forklift driver at the end of the day. The system basically uses a central brain. Uh, there's an AI brain that uh, basically determines which tasks that is coming from the ERP needs to be allocated to which uh, forklift and when and to optimize the route. Um, here again, 
uh, trying to mimic the decision-making process that uh, uh, the shift manager is uh, going through in order to determine which, em which uh, employee to send where. Um, here again, we, we, we didn't encounter any, any issues with the code per se, um, because these were very, very limited tasks for a very, very limited uh, um, you know, time frame. So um, um, th that's, uh, that's basically it. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, the, the, the challenge here was to mimic the, the, the way the brain uh, works, the, the way the human uh, brain works uh, without any you know, undesired side effects. Great, thanks, on Ben. Can I pass over to you for that question? Yeah, absolutely. So I think in in our we're a little bit closer to a lot of these debates around bias than than industrial applications are, and this is actually a really contentious question, especially over the last few weeks, because generally, if you look across the industry, including the top AI research labs in the Valley, you'll find two perspectives which are very, very uh, polarized because they're so similar. And this is one of those things where like, I hate my neighbor more than I hate this other guy because we're so similar. And the two perspectives really are that bias can sneak in in the construction of the model because the data set is poorly constructed. And we can come up with some edge cases of where the actual structure of the model might be biased with like specific cultural cues and what it's looking at. But generally, those are edge cases. The perspective that a lot of people have is that if there's bias in the data, then of course the model will be biased. And that's something that needs to be fixed on the data scale. And this, I think, is a very common view. But what's been happening recently, especially over the last few weeks, is you've seen even researchers within the same lab disagree, where one side is taking that perspective and the other side is saying, well, while that might be technically correct from a coding and training level, it's actually completely wrong because you would have only ended up in that situation if you completely ignored bias concerns in the entire design of your research and development process up to that point. And so that group really sees the challenges with bias around like human collaboration, around management of projects, around not baking these concerns in early enough in the development process so that you'll have a very clear image of the limitations of your product and be very specific um, that if there is any bias there, you already know about it before you embark on the training exercise. And so I do think both of these perspectives have merit. I mean, really, they're not saying that much different. It just gets very, very contentious because some people feel like, baking this in from the very, very early stages, especially when you're building a prototype, will only slow down development when at the end of the day, you're arriving in the same place. And so I think that's kind of a very vague answer because this debate has really blown up over the last few weeks and there's not one generally accepted position on where bias can creep in in the AI development process. Thank you, thank you, Ben. Um, um, I have a Quick question for you. It's not directly related to uh, the Musashi AI work you guys are doing, but because of your background, I think it's probably going to be interesting. Um, so the question has been, uh, the, the question is that um, AI has been making monumental strides in healthcare. Um, do you believe we should rely so heavily on intelligence that has numerous risks to our security and bias to our society? Um, and now I mentioned at the beginning that you were, um, you just started as an uh, entrepreneur in that, in, in that industry. So that's why I thought it may be an interesting question for you to, to ponder on. Well, I, I think the, 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 uh, the simple answer is that there's not enough uh, doctors, you know, um, uh, in order to, uh, for example, uh, look at x-rays or MRIs or CT scans. Um, you know, there are plenty of companies that are doing, uh, um, uh, using AI, for, uh, for medical imaging, for uh, uh, analyzing medical images. Um, I think that uh, we can definitely uh, take a huge advantage of AI technologies in order to, uh, I wouldn't say replace doctors because again, you know, there's this challenge that Ben uh, mentioned about biases, that uh, that's the biggest uh, challenge to train um, a real uh, AI model, a real uh, productive AI model, but I think that um, um, you know, we want to have uh, medical care that is more accessible. Um, one third or maybe more 
of the world's population have no access to CT scans or MRI tests. And I think, um, you know, if, if you uh, find a way to, um, to uh, modernize or uh, de democratize the, uh, the uh, medical healthcare through AI, um, you know, you can bring uh, healthcare to, uh, to, the, to, to the entire world, which is now only, you know, only the um, uh, developing countries uh, can, uh, can benefit from. So um, I think the power of AI in healthcare, healthcare is probably one of the, um, um, you know, industries with the most potential to benefit from, from artificial intelligence. And thanks, actually, I uh, went for an x-ray today and that was exactly the thought that uh, crossed my mind. It went very inefficient and I think uh, a machine would have gotten me in and out extremely quickly. Um, so yeah, it, it was something I thought literally four hours ago. Right. Um, thank you. So I am mindful of the time and we have uh, about seven minutes. So I wanted to finish up with kind of a more generous, uh, general question. And um, um, I know uh, we discussed uh, a little bit of that um, prior to this. Uh, and we talked a lot about the future, but um, can you share your thoughts on kind of how do you see the, the world with the AI in the future? And yeah, your thoughts kind of on the futurism, let's say. Well, you know, uh, this is a tricky question because the truth is that we have no idea about the future, right? Absolutely no idea. In fact, no one, uh, no one has a clue how the world would look like in 10 years from now. And uh, yet we're trying to educate our children for it. So um, I think at the end of the day, um, the future of uh, uh, mankind in a world of abundant AI technologies is really dependent on the utilization of our human capacities for innovation and creativity. Um, this actually reminds me a uh, famous uh, TED talk. I think it's actually the famous TED talk uh, that was uh, given by Sir Ken Robinson. And um, he spoke uh, about this uh, little six-year-old girl that um, uh, was in a drawing lesson. And the teacher uh, said that this little girl had a hard time paying attention in class. And in this drawing lesson, she did. And the teacher went over to her and said, what are you drawing? And the girl said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, but uh, no one knows uh, how God looks like. And the, go and the girl said, they would in a minute. So uh, I think that, you know, and Picasso actually said that all children were born artists and the challenge is to remain artists as we grow up. So I really uh, think that um, we have indeed shifted a bit from our natural um, human capacities over the years. Um, and I think that creativity and innovation and compassion are human capabilities which are super unique. And my contention is that they would never be able to be artici artificially built. And uh, we need to reallocate the extraordinary human capacities that we have for innovation and creativity and intuition um, to value add jobs where humans have added value over machines. Now, I think that no human should be working eight hours a day, you know, visually inspecting um, components, uh, transmission gears or anything else. Same as no human should be pushing carts or driving forklifts all day on a production floor or a logistic warehouse. There's nothing rewarding in these jobs. These employees um, are definitely not uh, feeling uh, content or self-fulfilled or challenged. Their employers are not utilizing these employees' real capacities to the fullest. So at the end of the day, everyone loses. So um, as I said before, I think the future is, is where we get back to our very basics. So we engage and enjoy in the primal things that uh, uh, we were created to do as humans. Um, and I really, really think we are on the verge of a new era uh, for mankind with uh, AI entering almost every aspect of our lives and making things cheaper and more accessible. I think there's a chance that people will not work just to make a living. We won't be spending eight, 12 or 18 hours a day at work. We will have time for leisure, more time to spend with our loved ones, uh, more time to work out and enjoy life. And all these good uh, materials with smart and responsible adoption of AI technologies. Thanks, Son. And Ben, uh, your kind of final thoughts on the future with, and, uh, yeah. What is your vision? Yeah. So <clears throat> I think Ann took the 
great high level view there. And I'll just agree that I think over the long term, what is the point of all of our capitalist systems and capital accumulation if it is not to give people better and easier lives? Like that's the point. And I think too often we lose sight of that on a short term basis. But to kind of get a lot more concrete here, while I think that's the long term goal, I, I do think that we can say what we know is going to happen in the next few years with AI and what we don't know. And the big distinction there is that with current technologies around deep learning, convolutional neural networks, big data sets used to train them, I think we're at the point now where you can pretty much build a system that can answer any objective question. And over the next five to 10 years, we will have general purpose expert systems that can easily outperform humans at a much, much lower cost at any objectively definable task. And the big thing is right now, there's no technologies out there that can extend that to the subjective. And this is really critical because while the vast majority of problems, for example, in industrial monitoring might be obvious, you might not be able to describe them, but they're obvious. At a certain point, somebody has to decide how to react to something novel. And that's the sort of technology that there just isn't really a development path for. And even as simple as in our world, we constantly get asked if we can identify suspicious people. And bias problems with that question aside, what is a suspicious person. It's a very subjective judgment. And I just don't think that there's technology, even on the horizon, that can repeatedly and accurately make subjective judgments, even as evaluated by a single person, let alone the kind of consensus that's necessary for an organization. So in the short term, we're going to see massive continued improvements in functional development of AI, but we're not going to get any closer to like the Androids or the C-3PO's that everybody still has in their mind or the HAL 9000s. So that's kind of my capstone statement there. Thank you. Appreciate uh, your participation. Uh, both you and On have been great uh, panelists. It was quite interesting to me and um, educational and uh, glad we could have this chat. Uh, I would um, encourage everyone who is on this call to get more involved with the alumni club in London. Um, you know, if you have any, any topics that you think are of interest to you, please share with us. Uh, People like Ben and all have been kind enough with their time and um, yeah, I'm sure the entire boot network will be very happy to uh, participate. So um, yeah, I would like to uh, thank, uh, apart from all and Ben, uh, Jenny and Penka, as well as Heather for helping with this event and making it happen. Um, thanks everybody and um, have a great uh, evening, morning, day, whatever is in your time zone. Thanks so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Georgian, and everybody who joined the call today. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.